Welcome to this episode of Pooches at Play. Yes, we're up in Sydney. I have had to leave Darcy and Vindy at home though, so we've got Lakota and Jess joining us instead. That's right, we don't have the two main stars, but we do have a lot of nutrition tips. I've got training tips, and Dr. Dr. Mel has got health. So sit back and enjoy the show. Enjoy it. I luckily don't have to worry about Pris. No, I do. <laughs> Come on, dogs. Come on. I suppose there's worse things in the world. Yes. This week's breeding focus is the Australian cowpea. Oh, I think you got me lips. And we are joined by Jenna, Chloe, Balto, Four, and Kev. I'm not sure you'll see them all up here all the time. From Peacock's Kelpie Stud. Bred for herding, they are Australia's most popular working dog and thrive when they're working on the land. I've always had a soft spot for Kelpie. They're extremely loyal and devoted to their family. They're affectionate, as you can see, and friendly. They're great with children and other dogs and even cats if they're raised with them from puppyhood. But don't be surprised if they hurt other pets and even the children because they just don't seem to be able to shake that habit. No, Darcy's always being herded by Kelpies. <laughs> they are a tough and tireless working dog with extremely high energy levels and aren't well suited for suburban living unless you're highly committed to channeling their energy and desire to work and into suitable activities. They are highly trainable and very alert, eager to learn and so they excel at obedience, herding, agility and many other dog sports. In fact, any Kelpie owner in suburbia should consider doing any one of these sports regularly with their dog on top of vigorous daily exercise. Absolutely. I mean, Kelpies can run up to 60 kilometres a day when they're working, so it's crucial that they have plenty of exercise to meet their mental and physical needs. If not, they'll become bored and frustrated and they'll just start to exhibit some serious behavioural problems. Yeah, that they will. So you might be surprised to learn that they have a double coat with short, dense undercoat and a weather repellent top coat, don't you guys? Very nice. And they come in a mix of colours from black to red with bits of tan and more. Oh yes, they do shed a lot though, so a weekly brush is a good idea. And lots of kisses. Kelpies are regarded as a very healthy breed and they can live up to 16 years. They can be prone to hip and elbow dysplasia. Lux patellas or kneecaps, mm -hmm. progressive retinal atrophy and a degenerative brain disease of the cerebellum. You can stay up here. It's not nice. <laughs> There's certainly a breed though that you need to consider very carefully to ensure that you are able to meet their high drive needs. We cannot stress how important this is. Absolutely. And there are places that you can take them to to mm. do their job, their herding job. That's right. All around Australia. So make sure if you get one that you really do consider this. Thanks guys, then there was one. Just you, but you'll do, yes. <laughs> to learn how HIF pet insurance can help your pet in times of need, visit hif.com.au. The Poor Pals program is run by McKillop Family Services and supported by Pet Stock Assist. It involves therapy dogs working with disengaged children and helps them to re-engage with education again. Today, I'm gonna to hear the story of one young boy and the difference it's made to his life and that of his carers. Rowan, what made you decide to become a foster carer? I had some friends who were doing foster care and I guess through them I became aware of the tremendous need that there is for people to volunteer to help these kids who have a really big need, I guess, in their lives for security, it's love, a home, all those things that many kids, I guess, take for granted, these kids often don't have. And tell me about the child in your care. He's now 10 years old. He's been in our care since he was three. Okay. As we started with uh, respite care, mm -hmm. which is one weekend a month. Mm -hmm. And then he came to live with us uh, when he was five, just before he started at school so he was there with us uh, full time and yes. from there we progressed to what's called permanent care mm -hmm. so he's now in our permanent care until he's 18. And how did he used to go with his schooling and interactions? Like many kids in care he often struggled to regulate his behaviours and emotions particularly in busy environments like school mm. um, which are often really chaotic and noisy so that's, yes. that's a really common problem and there's a lot of reasons for that and so we just found that mainstream schooling wasn't really providing him with the support I suppose that he needed to be able to develop those social skills yes. in order to be able to participate in mainstream society. And how has McKillop and the Poor Powers program helped? Um, McKillop's been uh, fantastic. Um, it's a small school environment. It has a therapeutic approach which is really at the heart of its its educational curriculum. Yes. And the Poor Pals program, I think, is really part of that. Animal therapy is a well-recognised, I guess, therapeutic mm. approach. 
It's really beneficial for particular um, kinds of kids. So kids who aren't engaged yes. uh, with education, kids who are really too young for talking therapy, mm -hmm. um, or kids who have trust issues with adults. Mm. So my child had all of the above. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that connection with an animal, I think, can just provide a really safe and non-judgmental space. And it's an experiential approach, I suppose, mm. as well. So it's very task-driven. Yes. Um, and so they can just really focus on building confidence and, and self-esteem. Um, and that's, I think, a gateway back to you know, uh, engaging, I guess, with the uh, education system again. Yeah, absolutely. And if someone at home was considering the idea of becoming a foster carer, but was a bit concerned or think, thinks that they're not up for it full time, what would be some advice that you'd love to give them? Um, I guess I'd say to people that you don't need to have special skills to be a foster carer. It's just ordinary people seeing a need and stepping forward, providing a home and just providing those ordinary everyday experiences that all kids need to be able to thrive. I think that's really important. Oh, lovely. Oh, well, if you'd like to find out more about the McKillop Family Services and also the Poor Pals Program, visit their website. And to learn more about Pet Stock Assist, visit theirs. Thank you, Rowan. <laughs>one of the most useful things an owner can teach their dog is place training, such as on your bed. It provides many benefits in many different situations. It's great for independence training as they learn to spend some time alone and great for meal time when you don't want their begging eyes looking up at you. If your dog is stressed, anxious or nervous, place training can also help your dog learn to cope with his surroundings and it provides them with their own safe spot to go to if it's done in a positive way. It can help dogs that spend a lot of time outdoors learn how to behave calmly inside the home by having them lay quietly, chewing a toy or treat until we give them the release yeah. cue. It can also be a useful tool to stop unwanted behaviour such as barking or overexcited greetings when people enter the house. Instead of allowing your dog to rush up and jump on people as they enter, you can give your dog the cue on your bed so they instead rush to their bed where they can wait to be greeted by the incoming guests. You guys do this most of the time. <laughs> you can also take it out or away with you when you need to keep your dog calm. To teach your puppy or dogs on the bed, one of the simplest ways to do it is to lure them over to the bed with a treat. As the dog steps fully onto the bed, mark it with a clicker or yes and reward with the treat. Repeat this several times and add the verbal cue on the bed. Again, mark and reward with the treat as soon as the dog steps onto the bed. Keep practicing this until you are sure your dog has made the connection between the cue words and the action. Once you are sure your dog has made this connection without the treat, then point towards the dog's bed, giving the cue on the bed, on bed. and reward with the treat once the dog actually walks onto the bed. We always want the bed to be a rewarding, positive place for the dog to be, and then we try to extend the time that they stay there. You can do this by restraining the dog on a lead while laying on the bed and provide a long-lasting chew like the Vita Pet Rabbit or Lamb's Ears to keep them occupied. That way you're starting to teach them to stay on there longer. Another great way to do this is by placing it near your feet when you're sitting and watching TV at night. Every few minutes, just sprinkle some really tiny pieces of broken treats onto the bed and rewarding the dog for quietly laying there. Your dog will soon learn that the bed is a great place to be and you can work on increasing the time you want them to spend there with positive rewards-based training. For more dog training tips and tricks, visit Vita Pet Central at vitapet.com.au. Duncan, one of the main concerns I've seen with people who are thinking about a raw food diet for their pets is they're kind of scared that the food's full of bacteria that's going to be harmful to their animals. Um, you're a vet. <laughs> what do you think about that? Um, look, I think raw food diets get a bit of bad press, to be honest. Like, the, there are pathogens associated with that kind of food, as well as others. Um, but the pathogens, like bacteria in there, can also be good. There's a difference between good and bad bacteria. Dogs and cats, their digestive systems are different to us. Their stomach is more acidic, and their gastrointestinal tract is shorter. So they've got less time for pathogens to replicate, as well as muscle meat protein to ferment. We've got to apply the germ theory different to them as well as us. But I would say that if the animal's immunocompromised, like on you know certain medications, like they're on chemotherapy or something, you've got to be worried about that bacterial load as well. But for the majority of dogs and cats, I think it's great. Why do you think people think that about raw food diets? So there's that they are bad. Uh, I think they're just more associated with like 
specific pathogens like Salmonella and E. coli are kind of the biggest ones, um, but they are actually ubiquitous in the environment. They're yep. actually everywhere. Your dog's going to go for a walk out in the environment stuff and probably lick or pick things up worse than what's in the food. They need to get bacteria from everywhere. Like yep. we also need bacteria because it's good for our microbiomes, so like our gut flora. So as long as you're adding prebiotics and probiotics to certain foods and things, as well as bringing in beneficial bacteria, um, you actually want to have that diversity mm -hmm. of bacteria in your gut. Yeah. So the more you have and the more diverse your gut is, they're shown with human studies that it's actually more beneficial for our immune system. Yeah. So you don't want to take a dog from like a kibble or dry food straight across to a raw food diet, do you? No, you want to make sure that you have that like transitioning period for, for anything, like if you're changing any kind of diet. Um, because if you give them something straight away, they're, one, their immune system's not used to it, and two, their gut's not used to it. So you can get things like, you know, vomiting and diarrhea and stuff if you, if you introduce any kind of food straight away. So you want to try and make sure that you give it slowly. So over seven to 28 days, you're just giving piece by piece. Some, you know, pet foods kind of add in preservatives that aren't good in other bits and pieces. So you want to be trusting the company as to having human grade quality, make sure that. And two, it's the same if you're handling any kind of raw meat and stuff at home in the kitchen. You want to make sure that everything's clean. So you're washing everything properly, washing your hands and like keeping stuff in the fridge. And also you want to watch out for expiry dates. So make sure that food isn't expired before you get it. What's the best way to keep it fresh? I like the method of freezing because it stops the bacteria from replicating. And it also means that like you're not adding any preservatives. So you get all these foods that like you know, the shelf life's quite long, even if they're in the fridge, like it should only last a few days. Otherwise, if they've got pres preservatives in it, it's gonna affect the nutrient profile. Um, whereas freezing is literally means that it's still fresh and you just defrost it to your dog. That's so. perfect, yeah. So if you wanna find out more about the benefits of a raw food diet, check out the Big Dog website. Should we come and find Jess? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Sort of running that way. <laughs>
their own private dining menu. And how cool are these Langham glasses? Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, Das, what are you having? Dice cooked Australian beef fillet, mixed vegetables and braised barley. Wow, I wonder if I can have some. Langham Melbourne Pampered Pet Staycations are available from $620 per night. This includes valet parking for one car, breakfast in bed for up to two people each day, a welcome amenity for your pet, the use of the Langham branded pet bed and bowl, and more. Check out langhamhotels.com for details. Yeah. Hanging with your mum. <laughs> It's important to ensure your dog is protected from parasites all year round. However, with so many different options, it can be confusing to know whether your dog has complete protection from the parasites they may be exposed to, including the potentially fatal paralysis tick and heartworm. Choosing the right parasite protection is essential, not only for your dog's health, but also for that of your family, particularly if you have young children. I'm often asked about the difference between NexGuard Spectra and NexGuard, for example. With NexGuard Spectra, your dog will receive the most complete parasite protection available against external and internal parasites in one tasty tube. NexGuard Spectra controls fleas, mites and the three most important tick species infesting dogs in Australia, including paralysis tick. Of course, don't forget to check your dog daily if you're in a paralysis tick area. NexGuard Spectra also provides protection against heartworm disease and the three most common intestinal worms, some of which can also affect humans, all in one monthly beef flavoured chew. By dosing monthly with NexGuard Spectra, you can provide the best protection for your dog and your family. NexGuard, on the other hand, provides the same level of protection against external parasites, fleas, ticks and mites as NexGuard Spectra, but it doesn't protect against those internal nasties, heartworm and intestinal worms. So you would use it in conjunction with other products that control these, like HeartGuard or Paragard. Remember, paralysis ticks and heartworm disease are serious and potentially fatal and can be found in many parts of Australia, as are intestinal worms. So it's important you know whether your pet is protected and choose the right products accordingly. Talk to your local vet or pet stock staff member if you're unsure or visit the NextGuard website for more information. As a pet stock rewards member, if you purchase any participating brand of flea, tick and worming treatment, including NextGuard Spectra, they'll give you 15% brand cashback to use the next time you shop for the same brand, even if it's on promotion. Visit the website for details. Grooming puppies and anxious dogs can be tough on everyone involved, so it's important to get your puppy used to being groomed early in life and making it a positive experience. First, get them used to having their paws touched by gently massaging them between the pads. This also helps with the nail cutting process and you are gonna need yours done soon. <laughs> Use a plastic tub if you haven't got a bath or sink and fill it with about 15 centimetres of lukewarm water. Gently place your puppy in and reward them for not struggling. If they do struggle, then gently hold them until they stop and that's the moment that you reward them to reinforce that desired behaviour. You can get some help if you need it and then use a bit of dog safe peanut butter on a spoon to focus their attention away on that. Gently cup water over your puppy's back, avoid their ears and eyes and use a face washer instead for that part. Use a small amount of all natural puppy shampoo like this DGG one on their back and then you just gently rub it in. Make sure you rinse them thoroughly and dry off with a microfiber towel. Best to just towel dry them the first few baths so they get used to the experience. If you have a long coated puppy, like little Schnooky here, use a detangler spray and then you brush out any knots before you actually bath them. Always put your fingers at the base if they do have any knots and then gently work them out. Now drying your puppy is the biggest problem groomers see in the salon, so never force your puppy to interact with a hairdryer or try and scare them because you could cause serious anxiety in your dog. Get them used to the dryer by starting it on the lowest setting and hold it far enough away that they just feel that breeze of air. Reward good behaviour and very gradually move it closer to the puppy. You don't want to go too quick and frighten them. Once dry, brush your puppy again. Let your puppy sniff and smell the brush. How's that? Yeah. And then gently move to brush in them again if they're still a little bit damp. If they want to bite at it or they start to wiggle, stop and try again when they're calmer. To help with your puppy grooming needs, look for the DGG range in quality pet stores or visit the DGG website. 
The beautiful chief here is quite the Instagram influencer, and I think someone here might be a little bit jealous about that. Now, Christina, that's not his only claim to fame, is it? He's also done a bit of modelling and TV work. Yeah, he's done a um, he's done a few photo shoots for <laughs> Leeds Collars Treats um, oh, and yeah. a bit of TV work as well. <laughs> yeah. And how does he enjoy the experience? He he loves it because he knows he's going to get a treat at the end. He's very um, food motivated. <laughs> now, how do you find the whole experience? Oh, I love it. I love taking him out. I love getting him to meet new people and meet new dogs. And I love meeting people that are in the same mind frame as me. So nice. it all works hand in hand. Oh, lovely. Yeah. And so did you have to do a lot of obedience training to be able to do this work? Yeah, so from a puppy, we did start with your basic general obedience. Your sit drops and everything mm -hmm. like that, your stays, um, which then obviously now helps us in photo shoots and TV work where they want him to stay yes. and not move or hold an item or a toy. Um, he does that with uh, no trouble, so <laughs> well, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we all have our days. I know. And does yeah. he get anxious at all on set, do you find? Uh, sometimes he can, especially if he's not familiar with the space. So prior to uh, meeting someone at the photo shoots mm -hmm. or wherever we go, um, I'll get him familiar with the area, give him some treats so we know it's a positive space yes. for him and he's happy and he's settled. <laughs> and then, yeah, we pretty much go from there. So do you think it's something that, you know, anyone with some pets that just love interaction out there could do? Um, yeah, definitely. I reckon um, any dog can do it, any breed, any shape. <laughs> That's the D again. Yeah, um, yeah, any breed can definitely do it, but I would definitely recommend um, just some basic training from yes. the beginning. Um, and then, yeah, then they can go from there, really. Yeah, that's exactly what we did, so, oh, nice. yeah. Oh, wonderful. Well, if you'd like to make your pet the next big super star, see what I did there, <laughs> visit A-List Animals. They're a pet talent agency at alistanimals.com.au. Want to win a Pawson prize pack value to over $2,000? One lucky person will win a year's supply of Vita Pet Treats, Big Dog Pet Foods, NextGuard Spectrum Monthly Chews, a $250 pet stock gift voucher, DGG Grooming and Apparel, and a year's subscription to Dog TV. Plus, there's five consolation prizes of my book, Each Play Love Your Dog. To enter, sign up to our E! News and tell us the name of one of the charities featured in this series. All entries also receive a free ebook, so visit poochesatplay.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I think I finally found some frizzy hair to have. <laughs> oh, you've got some hair now for sure. Hey, hopefully, like me, you learned a lot from the episode. And we'll see you again next week. See you guys. Have a good day. You have so much fun. Yeah, we've had a good day.